Good afternoon all. I would like to ask you to have a seat that we can start our afternoon session of day two. Afternoon session day two, it's or the panel three of today work is called Food Insecurity and Systematic Risk. What can we learn from the COVID-19 health crisis to address the multiple impacts of climate change for populations on the move? And I have a pleasure to hand it over floor to our moderator today, Ms. Monica Goraci, Director of the Department for Program Support and Immigration Management. Monica, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. And thank you all for coming back to this uh, afternoon session. And uh, welcome also to the uh, colleagues who are joining us online. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to moderate this session where we will hear from a diverse and very rich panel about some of the key lessons through the, uh, that they learned through the COVID-19 pandemic experience that we truly believe will be very useful in promoting a systemic approach to address food insecurity and climate change and strengthen the resilience of migration and displacement affected communities. As we have heard in the previous sessions at this IDM so far, resilience building and response will require longer term development, adaptation and disaster risk reduction policies involving whole of government and whole of society interventions. The increasingly intense and devastating impact of disaster, land degradation and water scarcity have made it really critical to address the impacts of climate change on migration, displacement and health. And this not in a siloed manner, rather in a joined up fashion together. Climate change has direct impacts on food systems and on health, such as through impacts on nutrition, for instance. There's also indirect linkages between climate change and health through reduction in food security overall. And this makes it really key to include human mobility and national climate action plans. And it also calls for strengthening services and systems for migrants, including for health and nutrition, taking measures to keep essential services running after disasters, and prioritizing access to sustainable and predictable financial resources for vulnerable countries. From IOM's own multi-sectoral experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic, this has been, and in some ways continues to be, a crisis of global health, but also global mobility and socioeconomic development. The pandemic has exacerbated existing structural inequalities among countries and within countries, hindering respect for and protection for the human rights and social inclusion of migrants and communities affected by migration. Now, the reliance on complex and interconnected global systems to deliver goods and services has certainly many, bene many benefits, but the COVID-19 pandemic has also showed us its negative impact on the resilience of key systems at country level. The pandemic has been a pertinent reminder to all of us as to how unconnected our lives are today. It has reminded us that focusing on preparedness, response and recovery from a human mobility perspective is essential and that restarting regular human mobility is important to mitigate the longer term socioeconomic impacts, whether these results from pandemic, climate change or food insecurity crisis. And most importantly, while the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the risks of certain groups and, and the risks that these face, it has also highlighted that migrants are at the front line of responses and are crucial to recovery. Therefore, in all our work, it will be important to consider migrants and communities themselves within multi-sectoral mechanisms, within monitoring and planning, when designing prevention, preparedness and response interventions, and for any future pandemic, and for the food and climate crisis we're faced with within uh, today. So we have asked our panelists today the, to address the following questions. How can we overcome critical gaps faced by migrants in the access to health services and proper nourishment? What are the lessons that we can draw from the responses to the COVID-19 crisis? And what are the good practices in uh, consultations that involve whole of government, civil society uh, and communities? We would uh, start this panel uh, with uh, 
Uh, our first speaker, Ms. Omnia El Omrani, COP27 President Envoy on Youth. Ms. El Omrani is the first official youth envoy for the COP27 President and the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Resident from Egypt. She has more than seven years of experience in climate change and facilitated over 74 hours of training sessions and workshops in 15 countries across the world. She is a commissioner at the Lancet Chatham House Commission on Post-COVID Population Health, a youth sounding board member of the EU DG INPA. She's an associate at Women Leaders for Plenary, Planetary Health and a member of the Global Youth Coalition for Road Safety at UNICEF uh, Youth Leaders Program. She has attended the last three UN climate change conferences in Katowice, in Madrid and in Glasgow. So, Mrs. El Omrani, you have the floor. Uh, yes, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me in this very important conversation, especially that right now we are less than two weeks away from the climate change conference that is going to take place um, in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. And um, for me, I am a, I'm the first ever envoy on use for COP in the past 27 years, and this brings in the urgency of addressing uh, the needs and the gaps when it comes to the impact of climate change and how disproportionate it is on children, adolescents, and youth. And this is one gap I would like to speak to as a young medical doctor who gets to see on a daily basis the detrimental impact of climate change on my community, ranging from asthma, as well as respiratory diseases to the rising levels of air pollution, to malnutrition because of the increasing incidences and rates of food insecurity and water insecurity, especially in my own country, um, as well as the mental health impact of climate change on the younger generation who see, who see their health, future, and prosperity endangered by the effects of the climate crisis. And when it comes to specifically thinking about climate mobility and how the changing uh, temperature and the effects on crops as well as the extreme weather events that has led to the death and injuries of many. And this is how I personally started my journey in climate change when I witnessed Hurricane Irma in my internship doing emergency medicine in Florida. And I saw how such an extreme weather event that had led to my own evacuation of my home because of the hurricane, to witnessing in the hospital the needs and the rate, the increasing rate of patients coming in with acute injuries, with distress because of this weather event. And if we go on a, on a greater scale, looking at how climate change has led to the migration of over 50 million children and youth being forced from their own countries, migrating across borders, and this is because of the extreme weather events that we are seeing. And if a child is born in 2020, according to a very recent study, compared to a person who was born in 1960, they are going to witness two to seven times the rate of climate-driven extreme weather events. And right now, over 500 million youth are living in areas with a very high risk of flooding, and nearly 160 million live in areas of extreme or high risk of drugs. And this brings us to my next point around what can we learn from the COVID-19 response? We have seen countries take urgent and serious steps because of COVID-19, the health crisis of 2020. And climate change is no different. Climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, as, as it has been said by the Lancet back in 2015. And seven years later, we do not see the same urgency. We still see inadequate climate commitments and pledges made every year at the Global Climate Forum. And this year, as, as a representative of the COP27 presidency, we want to change that. We do not want to discuss commitments. We want to move from pledges into implementation mechanisms. And this brings me to the third point in regards to how can we effectively address the climate crisis and the climate, climate mobility emergency? To do that, we need the voices of the most impacted communities, the ones that are displaced, 
especially the youth population. A, because we are disproportionately affected. B, because we have the agency, we have the solutions, and we want to be seen and integrated and mainstream into the consultations and the planning and the preparedness as equal and natural partners. We want to be, we want the decision-making spaces either at COP or at global climate forums like the one that we are today to be reoriented and to be youth sensitive and youth responsive to the needs that young people see at the forefront of the climate crises that are happening around the world. And that is why at COP this year, we are going to have the conference of youth taking place from the 2nd to the 4th of November that will build the capacity of young people to engage in climate change or climate mobility discussions, but at the same time, produce the global youth statement, which is the universal youth input to this year's COP, as well as the country's positions and plans as they move on from COP. I'm also happy to announce that we have a platform called the Youth COP platform that is showcasing the solutions that are being led by youth targeting all the different impacts of climate change to demonstrate that as young people, we have our demands and our voices that we want to be, we want them to be integrated in the planning for the protection of those at the forefront and those who are on the move. But at the same time, we want your support. We want to as our allies in the solutions and the actions that we are taking place on the local level, serving our communities that are vulnerable, but at the same time, our, our calls to action at the global level to policymakers across the world as youth and as, as a vulnerable population in a broader format, we have our own unique perspectives that we would like to see them integrated in a way to drive the same urgency, to drive the same lessons we have learned from COVID-19 into the climate mobility planning and implementation. Thank you so much and looking forward to the panelist intervention. Thank you very much, um, Omnia, for these, uh, these words and for sharing your uh, personal experiences on uh, the interlinkages between climate change and, and health, and also for raising attention to the staggering numbers of people living in uh, high-risk areas. I think it is also very important, and, and I think everybody is in the room and, and online has uh, heard your call to action to move from pledges to implementation mechanisms, as well as your call to include the voice of uh, affected communities, but in particular of youth as uh, an important actor, an actor that brings solutions at, that needs to be heard. As I mentioned in my, in my introductory remarks, we, uh, we have learned in the, in the COVID pandemic response that we need to include migrants and we need to include um, all different categories, affected people, youth, everybody who can bring a solution. Um, and and uh, so we, we take note also on your youth cap platform. I think it will be a very relevant platform and I encourage everybody to uh, have a look at the platform and see how to engage youth. So thank you very much again for your contribution. I will come back at the end of the panel with a, a question for you when we will close the session. So please stay with us. Our next panelist will be Dr. Luz de Regil, head of the unit on multisectoral action and food system from the World Health Organization. Dr. de Regil is uh, the head of the unit of, of this uh, multisectoral action uh, uh, unit. Uh, she supports governments to uh, protect them. She has 20 years of experience working in global nutrition and health and more than 130 scientific and policy publications. She has served as a speaker and public health advisor to UN agencies, governments, and global organizations. And she frequently volunteers as a board members of local and international uh, non-profit entities. Dr. Deregil, your floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I know that we will have a, a panel uh, later but i wanted to to share uh, our uh, learnings from uh, in the pa in, in the past years and i know that uh, you have been extensively discussing over the last uh, 
days, uh, the effects uh, of food insecurity, for example. So I hope that I, my points will not repeat what you have already discussed, but I wanted to share that um, we need to have urgent action to improve our food systems. I would say that uh, the last years have showed us a, a couple of things that our food systems are not able to provide healthy diets for all populations, that our food systems are vulnerable to multiple shocks, and that our food systems are draining uh, planetary resources the, in an um, unsustainable way. And everyone is affected, including uh, moving populations. I would think that uh, in many ways, uh, food systems uh, and migration have similar drivers, climate change, economic uh, drivers, conflict, poverty, and inequality. And climate change particularly, um, I mean, as we have discussed, uh, is, uh, are ch is changing uh, shifting patterns of mobility. Um, and it has effects on humans' uh, health uh, uh, directly. Uh, as uh, because people are moving as a result of this crisis and indirectly because food insecurity and other problems are increasing. And the health of refugees uh, is being affected. Uh, the recent uh, report uh, of health and migration uh, published by WHO um, shows that uh, food insecurity is highly prevalent among refugees and migrants and COVID uh, aggravated the situation. Refugees and migrants uh, are adopting a coping strategies that include um, skipping meals, borrowing money for food, or changing their eating patterns to be able to survive. That malnutrition and anemia was highly prevalent. Uh, our recent SOFI report, uh, produced by the uh, five UN, uh, UN agencies working in nutrition, showed that between in last in the last years. Uh, after COVID appeared, more than 150 million people are, um, are suffer hunger. Uh, that's a dramatic numbers. We are going back to numbers that we saw a couple of decades ago. Um, 193 million people are experiencing acute food insecurity, and we know that the hotspots are in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. We also know that food insecurity is not the only problem. Our diets in general, when, uh, when our uh, healthy diets are unaffordable, they are of poor, poor quality, and that is leading to an increase of obesity and overweight. Uh, and migrant populations or popu uh, moving populations are not, uh, they, are, they, they are not uh, excluded from that double burden of malnutrition. We know that they suffer food insecurity, but many of them, as per the report, uh, have non-communicable diseases, that, and the burden is increasing among refugee and migrant populations, uh, often linked to longer residence in, host, in the host country, and particularly in, in high and middle income countries. Uh, refugees and migrants may experience I issues related to underweight and weight loss, but at the same time, uh, they may, as they uh, come to the new country, they have an increasing, increasing risk of a high uh, body mass, mass index, overweight, obesity. And also they suffer from diabetes mellitus and hypertension, usually the response of unhealthy diets, changing uh, uh, behavioral patterns, uh, access to inadequate diets. And because they don't seek um, health uh, care, they often have the worst prognosis. Uh, so migrant and moving populations are ha carrying the double burden of malnutrition and disease, but also have, are having poor outcomes. So we know that our food systems are vulnerable to shocks. I mean, of course, they are, affect, uh, they are, able to, they are not able to provide unhealth, uh, healthy diets. However, and we know that they often are vulnerable to shocks. Uh, COVID-19, that's the purpose of this session, but also Ukraine's war have affected our system and also climate uh, extremes are also affecting our systems. So, I mean, 
I will defer to you, uh, Madam Chair, whether you want to discuss this now or we pass to other panelists. But I would say that um, we need to ensure that our food systems are able to deliver healthy food, that we take into account sustainability because the agricultural systems are the ones that are contributing to large amounts of gas emissions in the world and climate change, or are, and in turn are being affected by climate change. And of course, the dependency of some countries have a chain effect on the food security uh, worldwide. I know that we are going to probably discuss solutions later, so I will stop here unless you ask me to elaborate a little bit on some solutions that WHO sees to improve the food environment and food systems. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. De Reguil. Uh, it will uh, indeed be important to adopt multi-sectoral actions to promote resilience in, in food systems, especially to serve migrants and displaced populations. And thank you for highlighting also the vulnerability of migrants and the need uh, for migrants to have access to health systems, which they often don't. So this is a call that we're happy to join. We look forward to continuing strong collaboration with the WHO at the global and country level for promoting health of uh, migrants and ensuring that uh, human mobility is fully addressed in future pandemic preparedness and, and response. I would like now to uh, turn to our third speaker, Ms. Verena Knaus, Global Lead Migration and Displacement at uh, UNICEF. Verena has been uh, driving UNICEF's policy programs and partnerships focused on migrant refugees and internally displaced children. Prior to this role, uh, Verena worked at UNICEF's EU office in uh, Brussels as senior policy advisor. She also headed the Turkey Office of the European Stability Initiative, which is an independent policy think tank she helped co-found in 1999. Verena Knaus, we're looking forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you so much, Monica, and thank you, colleagues in the room and online. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be, to be connected. <clears throat> I have to apologize. I, got, I picked up a call from my little daughter so I may be sounding a bit coarse, but I'm hoping that I, I can still contribute to today's discussion. It's also been great to come after two, two excellent speakers who already touched on A, the importance of youth being at the table and continuing to drive our climate and migration discussions. And then now listening to Dr. De Regil about the particular impacts of food and how food, mobility and preparedness all interlink. What I thought I can maybe bring to today's discussion is to share a very brief story that has three parts. First, I want to introduce you to Elena and Marcilas. Second, I want to share one key lesson that we lost you. Seems that Ms. Verena, Verena Knauss's connection has gone down, unfortunately. Can we try to reconnect? Or we move to the to the next speaker and uh, wait for Ms. Knaus to resolve. Hmm? Shall we do that? Yes. Okay. So we'll move to our uh, fourth uh, speaker, waiting for uh, Ms. Knaus to reconnect. So we will hear from uh, Sri Hari Govind, Youth Advisor to Children, Cities and Climate Action Lab, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Steering Committee member at Haifa. Uh, Sri Hari Govind is a doctor from India. He currently works as a climate health fellow for the Global Consortium of Climate and Health Education, Milman School of Public Health, Columbia University. He has an active role in different organizations, including as a youth advisor to children, 
Cities and Climate Action Lab at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Integration and Protection Lead in the Migration Working Group at the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. His main interests include public health and climate change, as he hopes to work on breaking the silos that exists between them. So we look forward to hearing from you on, on how you want to do that. Please, Mr. Govind, you have the floor. Um, greetings, everyone, and thank you to IOM and the moderator for this opportunity to be a speaker in this panel for this important discussion. My name is Dr. Sri Hari Govind, and representing the Migration Youth and Children Platform, which is the main global facilitator for youth engagement at the GCM and mandated at the GFMD. First, I would like to start by highlighting the effective preparedness, prevention, and response requires a migrant inclusive policy. By including migrants in national plans, including socioeconomic response plans, policies, and strategies, Gaps in health and other inequities, such as access to education and information, training and decent work will be diminished while we strengthen our efforts towards achieving SDGs. Food insecurity, while being both a driver and a consequence of migration, is also common during migration when people are on the move. With human mobility and particularly forced displacement on the rise, we are on the brink of a hunger pandemic. With 8.9% of the world's population food insecure, there are currently more than a billion people affected by nutritional inadequacy. That is a billion people with the potential to be on the move, where one in three migrants being under the age of 30. There must be specific attention towards age-sensitive migrant policy. COVID-19 has revealed the vulnerability of people on the move and shown us critical gaps in the access of young migrants to health services and proper nourishment. And parallels can be drawn for any climate disaster or event that occurs with the COVID-19 health crisis. For the first example, I would like to bring to light the impact of school closures on migrant children. Often living in poverty, many migrant children depend on school lunches and other services being provided at schools. These school lunches go a long way in ensuring required nourishment for growing children. In the event of COVID-19, many children around the world who depend on this form of nutrition went without, leading to double or triple burdens of negative health impacts. Additionally, critical services such as health screenings, referrals and feeding programs, which happen in schools, are essential in realizing universal health preparedness and need to be maintained. And in the event of closure, we need to make available replacement services to all children regardless of their status and inform migrant communities in a timely manner of all the changes that are made so we don't leave this vulnerable population behind. Additionally, migrant children and youth, especially when unaccompanied, face specific risks during a crisis. To mitigate risks, any preparedness, prevention and response measure to COVID-19 or climate-induced crisis must uphold the principle of best interest of child regardless of their migrant status. These include ensuring universal access to health and other essential services, including mental health and psychosocial support, menstrual health services, and gender-based violence services. As an example, in early 2021, India faced the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic, which led to an alarming rise in COVID-19 cases and related deaths. The mass grief resulting from the loss in death has had widespread immediate and long-term impacts on mental health across the age spectrum, disproportionately affecting the younger population. Essential mental health services such as psychotherapy and clinical hypnotherapy sessions, usually done in person, have been affected since the onset of the pandemic. This scenario has laid the foundation for the delivery of mental health services via telehealth, which often has resulted in poor rapport between the therapist and the patient, problems with diagnosis, and lack of empathy. I was part of a pilot study to determine the extent of accessibility and efficacy to mental health helplines among young people across India, of which 40% of the 1,172 participants were migrants. With mental health being low priority in health planning at local and national level, the majority of participants reported lack of confidence in online mental health services. 
we need to identify ways forward as international multilateral organizations, as governments, and as civil society to overcome the barrier of access and reliability of online telemental health services. As the need for psychosocial support is going to be ever on the rise. Another gap is the availability of unavailability of wash services. Migrant children have scarce access to wash facilities, especially in the event of crisis. Wash facilities must be available for young people. If not available, it needs to be communicated clearly, especially in a language understood by children and young people. We need to incorporate hygiene information into curriculum and educational strategies for children and young migrants. Compounded with these factors and food insecurity recently being exacerbated by climate change and a host of unsavory international policies that have led to the loss of diversity in our food in terms of nutritional value has a detrimental cascading effect to an individual health and well-being. And this is compounded by multitudes of socioeconomic and cultural factors for a migrant. Bearing the brunt of this would be the most vulnerable of these communities, that is the youth and children on the move. Food insecurity for migration before, after, and on the move, along with other critical gaps, is often seen in the context of international development, in, in the context of development assistance and humanitarian aid. Although important, it cannot be seen as the sole response in this day and age. Countries must translate commitments and plans into strong action and financing whereby they invest in local food production and diversify seed use to enable food systems to become climate resilient and crisis resilient. To ensure these actions and financing are effectively implemented, countries must implement well-designed and inclusive migration frameworks and policies, which see migrants as core members of the community, empower and engage migrants in healthcare planning and designing interventions and strengthen their inclusion and integration into existing healthcare and social protection systems and policies with financial risk protection for young migrants accessing these services and ensuring child protection services as, as essential in all recovery policies and plans. In the global or national policy forum, whether it be for climate change or DRR or food, food systems or migration, the silos that exist between sectors and ministries are, are often given as an excuse for inefficient work done to address major issues. As a young person, I find this unacceptable. I would like to reiterate silos between sectors and stakeholders across ministries in the government level is an insufficient excuse to not address this existential issue. In an interconnected world to effectively address the impact of climate change, food insecurity and displacement, we require a whole of society and a whole of government approach, working across sectors and stakeholders with an importance to young people. The engagement of young migrants themselves as key stakeholders in the community and at the decision-making table is vital for the sustainability of national plans and policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Govind, for these, uh, for these words and uh, for reiterating the need to include uh, migration in uh, national uh, climate action plan, but also for highlighting the, the, the mental health need and the vulnerability to uh, mental health that uh, stem from, from, the, from the pandemic and, um, and, and the need to really uh, overcome the barriers to access to mental health. You mentioned uh, language and, uh, and, and, and cultural needs, and it's important that we have culture-sensitive services that allow uh, migrants and youth to access uh, the, the, the services. And also for, for closing uh, your remarks with, with the need for a whole of government approach and, and for the fact that it's no excuse to non-action. And, and it is important that, that actually uh, the governments and the society come together and address the, the impacts of, uh, um, of, of you know, the, 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 the need for, for integration and action on migration governance. It's only by having a whole of government approach that we can effectively address uh, migration governance and migration management. I'm uh, wondering whether Verena Knaus is back online.
I am, Monica. Ah, you are. Okay. Okay, then go ahead. Thank you so much, and apologies earlier. I'm currently in Kosovo, and as many places in the world, it seems internet and electricity isn't stable. So apologies in advance in case they disappear, but I have no regrets because there are such great panelists already here that maybe my marginal additional contribution can be picked up by uh, Mr. Govin, by David or by others who already spoke earlier. Um, very briefly, let me try to walk you through what I wanted to share today. Um, I wanted to introduce you to seven-year-old Alena, who has been driven from her rural home in Bangladesh, which is one of so many farming communities that are getting devastated by drought and the ever more frequent cyclones. Um, her family moved, like so many others before her, to Dhaka, where she now lives in the urban slums, but struggling to make ends meet, she actually had to leave school, just having started it, to help the family earn an income. Alena's family has joined the nearly 400,000 low-income migrants who arrive in Dhaka each year, a silent but steady exodus of climate migrants who are leaving different parts of the country. In, F in effect, it's estimated that close to 70% of Dhaka slum dwellers have fled some type of environmental hazard. Today, Alena lives in close quarters without adequate water and sanitation systems. Diseases spread quickly, as has COVID in her community. There is no public health clinic, a reality that she shares with almost 93% of other slum residents. For Alena and her family, the climate crisis is no abstract future scenario. It is her lived reality today. And for her and for millions of girls like her, investing in climate resilient, critical child services, whether these are schools or water systems or social protection systems that also include migrants themselves is actually a matter of life and death. Meanwhile, far away from her reality, I want to introduce you to Marcelas. Marcelas is a teenager in Ethiopia who has suffered together with his family of four consecutive seasons of poor rainfall, sharp increases in food prices, and most recently, the impact of conflict. Marcelas' own community has been ravaged by conflict in Ethiopia itself, but also by the war unfolding far away in Ukraine, which is disrupting the global food supply chains and making an already dire hunger crisis in the Horn of Africa worse. It's almost ironic, I would like to say, that Marcellus' name actually means tasting honey. There isn't much honey to taste in his life today. Earlier this month, around 8.5 million people in the Horn of Africa, including 4.2 million children, were facing severe water shortages. And as we speak, close to 20 million depend on immediate food assistance. In search of survival and seeing no future where he is today, Marcellus is planning to follow his cousins on the dangerous track north through Sudan and Egypt in the hope of surviving and supporting his family. The choice he's facing is either to move irregularly and at great risk or to move safely. But in the absence of pathways available to young migrants like him, boys like him, those already impacted by the impacts of climate, there actually is no choice. Alena and Marcelas show us how climate change, health and human mobility are already intricately linked. In their young lives, they have been impacted by all three. Now, how do we untangle this? What do we blame first? Is it the climate crisis? Is it fragility or poverty? Whatever angle we want to take as we look at what actually makes their life hard, what is very clear is that mobility, whether it is being forced to move or choosing to leave, is already part of Alena's and Marcela's adaptation and coping strategy. The choice we have is how do we manage and plan for a future where climate mobility will become ever more important. Now, what is the lesson that we should have learned from COVID as we're thinking and preparing for a future where ever more children will be uprooted in a changing climate? Like COVID, climate change is a global emergency. But also, and we heard this before, like COVID, it is hitting different communities and different groups within those communities very differently. It doesn't feel the same for everyone. 
it certainly doesn't feel the same for me or for my children as it does for children in Dhaka slums or in the Horn of Africa. The most vulnerable with the least coping capacities, children and already fragile communities are already being hit the hardest. We know that children are disproportionately impacted by climate shocks. Omran has said it before, 1 billion children are at extremely high risk to the impacts of climate change today. This includes 820 million children exposed to heat waves and their impact, or close to 400 million children living in high risk areas devastated by cyclones every year and every year and every year. Wonderful and beautiful places like Antigua, Barbuda or Honduras, where life at school is almost becoming the minority of the month because most of the months or many months a year, schools are closed due to the impacts of cyclones. Compared with adults, we also know that children are physically more vulnerable to the direct and the indirect impacts of climate change and the environmental hazards that also Dr. De Regil has spoken about. Many children like Alena, who are now crammed into close living quarters in urban slums or crammed into rural communities where food is becoming ever more scarce, they are much more likely to suffer from infectious or waterborne diseases. Diarrhea, old, old diarrhea continues to be the second leading cause of death and the leading cause of malnutrition for children under five. It almost seems unthinkable that in the 21st century, we haven't been able to really get a handle on this. Also, every time, every day, every second, the number of children suffering from severe wasting is increasing at a scale that is almost unimaginable. In the 15 worst affected countries, every single minute, and I think I've spoken maybe for six minutes now, one additional child is suffering from severe wasting. So that's by now seven more children whose long-term prospects will forever be affected by what that child is experiencing today. And in addition to those physical health risks, we've already heard of the incredible impact on the mental health of children and the scarcity of adequate services in languages, in formats, in ways that are accessible to those already uprooted. But we also know that it isn't just children who are suffering disproportionately. It is also particular places where climate shocks, fragility, conflict and displacement are all concentrating to create a lethal and a potent mix. We know that there are 33 countries, according to UNICEF's own Children, Children Climate Risk Index, where these effects all come together in a lethal combination. Of those 29, so almost all those countries are also fragile. And it is no surprise that at the peak of the COVID crisis, 95% of new conflict-related displacements recorded worldwide actually happened in the same countries that are also vulnerable to the impact of climate change. I would like to share how Timothy, a 14-year-old boy living in Fiji, has described the reality he lives through every day, every day and every, every month. The sea is swallowing villages, eating away at shoreline, withering our crops, relocating people, cries of loved ones, dying of hunger and thirst. It's catastrophic. It's sad, but it's real. And what Timothy describes is the reality for millions of children. Last year, 10 million children were internally displaced because of weather related events only. Now, looking into the future, what does that mean for us? And what are these lessons and how do we apply them? And I couldn't agree more with what had been said earlier, um, that it's no longer about pledges, it is really about action. So at the moment, we are actually facing a future where we see more and more children being displaced and uprooted because of climate and as a way of adapting to the realities of climate. Migration is just one of many, but a really important and critical coping mechanism and adaptation strategy, especially for children and young people. But our migration laws and the policy frameworks that we have in place, including the most recent ones, the Global Migration Compacts or the Global Refugee Compacts, they have not really kept pace with the changing demands of a changing climate. They are not yet fit for receiving, protecting or realizing the rights of environmental migrants. There is really still, unfortunately, a lack of a robust policy framework that addresses those needs of children on the move in the context of the climate. But the good news is, 
And here, Monica, I want to share some optimism because we've been hearing a lot about the challenges and the crises and the dilemmas facing us. The good news is we can actually prepare for what we know is coming. The future that is happening is already happening today. So we can learn from what is happening in Dhaka, in Fiji, in Antigua, Barbados, and in our communities all around. And we have also been learning through COVID that anticipatory action shouldn't be just a nice buzzword that we throw around in Geneva as we meet and talk and plan. It is actually critical. It is life-saving. So how do we prepare for this epidemic, the next climate impact um, that is already happening and unfolding? We can map, identify, and prepare for where children and young people will be moving from and where they will be moving to. And that is exactly what also UNICEF we've been trying to do, and we are very excited to soon be, shaped, be able to share with you um, an attempt on our end just to look and learn from the last five years, understanding where climate impacts and child displacement have intersected, and to see what we could possibly predict of where children will be moving from and will be displaced from due to climate in the next five years. And then we want to engage with all the partners here today to help us refine the model and the conclusion. But more excitingly, we've also been working together with IOM and with young people and with practitioners around the world to think really hard, what can we bring, what can we put on the table in terms of a very initial framework to address the needs of children uprooted in the context of a changing climate. So last year we came, or this year, a few months ago, in fact, we were able to present a new set of guiding principles for children on the move in the context of climate change. The idea was really born when we got together, UNICEF, IOM, young climate activists, policymakers, practitioners. And after two days of discussion, we said, well, let's just try one thing. Let's develop a set of guiding principles for children on the move in the context of climate change to guide what practitioners, what policymakers, what frontline service providers can and must do to prepare for the future that is already happening. Now, these guiding principles are available and we're very happy to share them, but more happily would we be if you would use them, if we would use them, and if we can actually take them into the discussions at COP and beyond and apply them and stress test them and use them and see, is that enough? Is that one of the frameworks, one of the pillars that we need to plan for climate mobility that is centered also on the needs of children? I personally am very excited. In, despite all the doom and the gloom, I think we have learned a lesson during COVID. And that is that it's no good shutting borders or hiding in our own living rooms. We have to work together because we are not safe if parts of the world are not safe. But we are also, if we work together across borders and boundaries, including across sectors and across ages with young people, I think we can find the solution. So we are very excited to see many of you again at COP27 itself, not to make more pledges, but to actually learn and speak and learn from young climate activists themselves who will be there, who will be putting more ideas on the table and who will be shaping hopefully with us together a future where climate mobility is an integral part of our toolbox. I think we have learned one thing in COVID and that is when borders close, we all suffer. And when borders are managed safely and humanely, we can find solutions. And that is borders across sectors, silos, sciences. And I'm very excited to be taking this forward together. And I think, Monica, you asked us to reflect on what is it that we need to do in this interconnected world that we're in to really address both the impacts of climate change, food insecurity, and displacement. I think climate mobility is the future, and it has to be a priority that we need to shape together. And I also think that working with young people is the future. If we invest and prepare together, I think we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Verena. I, uh, I, I have actually this question for our closing moment, and I will ask the same question to all the panelists and ask them to conclude the questions with, the, with their views. Thank you for bringing to us the story of Elena. Marcila and Timothy, I think it, it shows well that, uh, you know, wherever uh, they are independently from where they are, uh, they're facing multiple crises, conflict and climate induced and, and, and face the same experiences that, that really call for, for action. I think you mentioned the need for uh, legal and safe pathways. It's something that came 
out of the discussion also this morning and, and that mobility is part of adaptation and coping strategies already. And, and you conclude with a, with a positive view on, on the fact that, that we can prepare. I think the, the issues you raised around forecasting and the needs to, to look at what's coming and how we can be prepared is very important. I think all of us have together the tools to do so and to look at what will be coming and to prepare so that borders are never closed again because we still are grappling with the impact of the fact that we have closed these borders. And, and thank you also for highlighting the guiding principles for children in the move. Uh, on the move, I think that uh, you know, we can bring together frameworks. We have the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. And we can link everything that, that we do, the, the, the additional frameworks to the, the global compact so as to make it really our overarching framework uh, within which we can um, address uh, the, the needs of all the different uh, people on the move. I now uh, turn to my colleague to see if there is um, some uh, requests for the floor from uh, online or in the room. I think the, the floor is open if you want to make some remarks or comments. In this moment, we don't have anything online and in the room. If we don't have, do we have, yes. We have our colleague from IOM. Please, you have the floor. Yes, hi, thank you very much, Monica, for giving me the floor. It's, it's a great pleasure to listen today to all our panelists and uh, learn from stories from children experiencing the, the harsh effects of climate change in the field. And um, I'm very happy uh, Verana mentioned the guiding principles that I am in UNICEF has recently released. That is a policy framework that looks at protecting children on the move in the context of climate change. And we hope everybody will, will make use of this uh, uh, very unique policy framework that will help us to, to look more into these uh, issues. And from my own side, uh, I would like to, to mention on a few things. Uh, first and foremost, without climate action, we know that the young generation will be the one feeling the harsh effects of climate change in the upcoming decades. But youth, it is not only about the future, youth is very much about the present. Young, young people are already victims suffering the effects of climate change on their mobility, well-being, and livelihood. But they are not only victims, they are also key partners in fighting climate change and avoid its worst impacts on their mobility. When it comes to young people, migration should be a choice and not a necessity. Uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated, governments cannot act in isolation in the face of an immense global crisis. At IOM, we are currently preparing our engagement for the COP27 and for the Climate Change Conference of Youth, COI-17, that is scheduled to take place in Sharm el-Sheikh at the beginning of November. Uh, in, through this engagement, uh, IOM engagement in this conference, we are very much looking, in, looking to listen to young people and bring their messages and voices in all IOM events at COP27. Youth is a key partner in addressing climate change and its impacts on human mobility. It is crucial we raise youth voices and enhance their participation to achieve an inclusive mobilization of the whole society in decision-making processes related to climate change and migration. But it's not enough we just listen to their voices, we need to understand them. And it's not enough we just give them a place to the table, we need to take into account their recommendations and concerns about their future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Any, we, I don't we see. We had a request online from the Network UK, Voices Network UK. Please wait uh, while we are connecting him. We, according I to the information to I see, we have the Voices Network UK online. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, 
I'm Shah Mahmoud Nasri from Wises Network, which consists of asylum seekers and refugees in the UK. Uh, I just want to raise some of the issues in terms of food security, climate changes, and of course, lesson learned from, from COVID uh, emergency. Uh, in terms of terminology, let's say food security or food and nutrition security and climate changes. These are two different terminology. And then food security, it's not only the survival issues. This is much more survival and development, brain and cognitive development, and, and long learn. It's individual, community, and, and, and then the country development, socioeconomic development, and of course, contributing to, to the GDP. This, this issue should be, you know, considered that whenever we are talking about food security, we should consider the nutrition security and also development, mainly for the children and of course their mothers. And uh, migrant and uh, refugee and asylum seekers, community or society, the issue is not that much considered. Whenever we are talking about food and nutrition security, affordability and accessibility, of course, availability and accessibility, but we should think about affordability as well. And then the sustainability aspect should be highlighted. And of course, utilization is another issue that linked to how to utilize much more behavior changes issues. But, you know, there's not a, a regular you know, surveillance and monitoring system to see the, the progress, the development of the children in terms of nutrition, which is lack. And then I'm sure that this system is, even with uh, our organized system is not there, but I do not know, in a huge um, refugee settlements, I, I don't, but there could be a regular monitoring system to that. And then climate change, as uh, Dr. Virinam mentioned, climate change is not a sudden issue to come. Now it's become part of our emergency preparedness, not to be responsive and then like COVID-19 came and then we were, you know, rush to do planning and then to do timely response to that because we were not well prepared for that. But you know, climate changes, I, I, it's a, an existing emergency which impact food and nutrition security, mainly to the migrant and asylum seeker settlements in communities. And listen, learn from COVID, it could be a contributing factor for our preparedness, but we have to be prepared for all situations. You know, you see the the, the recent flood in Pakistan and Afghanistan and other countries, which was a huge disaster. And then how many displacements and how many people they were in, in short and real need of food and, and other health services. And then of course, mental health is a consequences of such situation to be others as well, which is poor, poor attention is toward that. What I would like to, to suggest that let's do and set up a mechanism how to respond on time. Of course, uh, there was the resilience issue mentioned that it's a long-term solution, but we have to be prepared. It should be in our top priority. Resilience is part of that because we have to also give the knowledge to the community, give the knowledge to the parents, give the knowledge to the, to the migrant community. They also, and then of course, we have to work in a well-coordinated manner, not only to put on duties the issues, but we have to tackle. And then of course, uh, based on my understanding, we do not have that much influence on, on climate changes, but they can do further advocacy 
and then further communication to convince those that they are involved in climate changes. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and then listening to my voice. Thank you very much for sharing your, your thoughts and, and highlighting the need to work on preparedness. If there is no other interventions, uh, I would like then to go back to our panelists and, um, and I would like to ask them if they have some, uh, some, some final words to share and I would like to ask each of them to, to uh, conclude this sentence. In an interconnected world to effectively address the impact of climate change, food insecurity and displacement, we would need to and I will start with Omnia. Uh, yes, um, so my sentence would be we... We lost you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so we would need to use the evidence, use the real life experiences and stories of communities, especially the younger generation at the front line, translate the challenges as well as the science into policy actions in a way that is sustainable, inclusive, using formal par participatory mechanisms to make sure that our voices are integrated effectively and most importantly to learn from one another from what countries are doing in terms of ensuring that there's a meaningful integration and mainstreaming of voices of the most vulnerable into the preparedness and the policy actions developed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Omnia. Uh, I would like to ask the same question. So in an interconnected world to effectively address the impact of climate change, food insecurity and displacement, we would need to, to lose. And I would like uh, to ask you, Luz, to add also, you said at the beginning in your intervention that you wanted to come back to some points, so please feel free to do so. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I will, use, I will uh, put the thoughts together. So in an ideal world, I will improve investment and policy decisions that can transform food and health systems. Um, what I um, wanted to say that is that there are three critical actions that uh, we need to do uh, to achieve what I said. Uh, first, adopt uh, multi-sectoral policies. Uh, we need to work on health. Uh, of course, food and agriculture, environmental, Social protection came up uh, as a recurrent area uh, to ensure food security and COVID uh, showed that uh, those systems are critical to ensure that people have access to food, uh, but also uh, to be able to survive as they navigate crisis. crisis. Social protection increased uh, in most of the countries now have uh, social protection programs. I think that now 194 countries had uh, social protection programs uh, as a result of COVID. So uh, keeping those systems functioning is, is critical to uh, in the preparedness part. Um, we need to um, ensure that some policies are repurposed to achieve better outcomes. It's often, um, we often say, we need to do more, we need, but sometimes we, th we have to think about how we can repurpose what we have to make it more efficient. And on the food system side, we have identified uh, fiscal subsidies, uh, shifting uh, incentives for, from producers to consumers, for example, um, identifying price, price incentives as policy actions that can improve the efficiency and resilience of food systems. Uh, all options have trade-offs, and I want to make sure that we always are aware of the trade-offs. But certainly, it's possible that our food systems become more resilient as we uh, consider the options, uh, that our uh, food systems become more resilient, that also deliver healthier diets for all, uh, and in, in the amounts that we need, uh, and without affecting the environment. The second action that I would say is that in addition to improving the uh, multi-sectoral policies, we need to improve food environments, the, the spaces where people access food. There are several actions that WHO has promoted as part of this package of actions. And again, I will go back to the point that um, 
it's not only about the food insecurity, it's about the quality of the diet. Uh, moving populations have uh, non-communicable diseases. They, call, uh, they bring with those conditions from their countries or they develop in the new countries, for example, the new settings, and often don't take care. Um, we don't need to forget uh, that uh, they carry the double burden of malnutrition. So WHO has developed uh, six policies to help improve um, the environments of which, in which people access food. Reformulation of foods and products and beverages to make, a, that's the first one, to make them um, healthier with less sugar, less free, um, less salt, less unhealthy uh, fats. That's the first option. The second is fiscal policies. There is a good way of improving and incentivizing the production of healthier foods, local production of healthier foods in many cases, and disincentivizing or taxing on healthy food options. The third option, and again, is part of uh, the systems uh, that governments have in place, is to make sure that all uh, government procure food that has conditions to be healthy. Uh, when people are, are consuming food uh, and receiving food as their main source of uh, nutrition, uh, I mean, particularly the liver and social protection, it's important that that food has the right uh, nutritional profile. But we go to schools, uh, uh, I mean, that's one of the areas. Uh, all other services where uh, governments provide foods, they can be healthier. And certainly uh, we can implement that. Appropriate food labeling is another way to ensure that consumers are engaged and informed uh, and to make healthier choices. Uh, food fortification is another critical intervention to ensure that uh, the different populations uh, particularly moving populations and refugees and migrants, have access to vitamin and minerals, to higher quality diets. And the last but not the least is that uh, we need to, have, uh, uh, to be aware that we need to prevent uh, practices or harmful marketing practices, particularly of foods that are directed to children. Uh, diets that are um, Many unhealthy foods are cheap and are directed to children. So we need to ensure that we protect them from that a uh, harmful influence as we ensure that we deliver and government deliver uh, and all the communities deliver healthier food. So that's the second action. Let's improve food environment. And the third is let's keep strengthening health systems to be responsive to the needs of the moving populations. There are frameworks to do that to make sure that uh, we mainstream or it's, uh, migration policies are mainstreamed into the, uh, the health systems. So with those three actions uh, that are related to investment and policy, I think that it was a long, uh, we can improve, um, I mean, services uh, for uh, and food that uh, moving populations receive, particularly in the context of climate change that we have been discussing about. So that's a long answer to your question. I hand over the, the mic to you. Thank you very much, Luz. It's indeed a long, it, it, it has become a very long sentence, but it's so very, I will summarize it's, it. it's very important. Adopt multi-sectoral <laughs> policies, improve food environment, and keep strengthening health systems. That's a much shorter sentence, but it's very important points. So thank you very much for making them. And now, Verena, you, I know you, you already uh, mentioned the sentence, but I will ask it to you again. In an interconnected world to effectively address the impact of climate change, food insecurity and displacement, we would need to? Now I'm cheating, Monica, if I may. I will use the opportunity to just add another twist um, as I'm thinking of my sentence. Um, I would say in an interconnected world to address the sort of the triple whammer of climate change, food insecurity and displacement. We will need to invest in those child critical services to make them climate resilient. That's the schools, the social protection systems, the child protection systems to make sure they stay open and operating before, during and after the climate emergencies. We also need to think more creatively of what drives mobility. And I think here recognizing food insecurity and you know the dependence on climate sensitive agriculture is really important. And then thirdly, really, we need to embrace climate mobility as a key adaptation strategy. 
I think here we can be bolder and we can be more forward leaning. And I think many of us working in the migration space, we know talking about planned relocation, evacuation, long-term mobility options isn't necessarily always a popular topic, but it is an inevitable topic. So it's exciting and I look forward to really seize that opportunity of harnessing what climate mobility can offer to all of us in that interconnected world. Back to you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Verena. And now I turn to Sri Hari. So for you, in an interconnected world, to effectively address the impact of climate change, food insecurity and displacement, we would need to? Um, we would require, I would at least say, we would require a whole of society, especially, and then a whole of government approach, working across sectors and stakeholders with importance to young people, but we also need to build policy for resilience and also build community resilience, especially since they often become first responders to any crisis. We need to additionally build diversity in the local diet and use more nutritious climate resilient seeds, which were used prior to the prior when uh, before the globalized private, private interest took over. Uh, lastly, it would be the engagement of young migrants themselves as key stakeholders in the community and at the end, the decision-making table, which will be vital to the sustainability of national plans and policy. Thank you. Thank you very much and thanks to uh, all our panelists for their contributions. I think three points that uh, I take away from this discussion, which was very rich with uh, also concrete examples uh, coming from migrants themselves and, and, uh, and from our panelists is the first is the, the need for multi-sectoral policies through whole of governments and whole of society approach for resilience food systems and for access to, to, to healthcare. The second is the voice of migrants and the need to include migrants in uh, the planning and in the search for solutions. And the third is from pledges to action. I think it's time for implementation and for action. And we count on all of you to, who, who will be uh, in Egypt in, uh, in less than a few weeks to make sure that mobility is included as uh, an adaptation and a coping strategy. So thank you very much for your participation. And uh, this panel is now closed. Thank you, Monica, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, our next panel will start in thank 10 minutes, 4.30 sharp. Thank you. Thank you. It was very good, because I like the sum up the Francisco Pechum and the Mina, the talking points of the vision of the implementation. <laughs>